Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to meeting number two for the Johnny Cake Elementary Capacity Relief Study. We extend a warm welcome to members of our committee as well as members of the public that are here joining us tonight. We also have members of Team BCPS that are here to provide support as well as answer questions that may arise. Joining us, we also have one of our board members, Ms. Lisa Mack, who's joining us tonight to view the process as well as to uh, create an understanding as well of what we are about to engage in as in terms of identifying some ways within which we can provide relief to Johnny Cake. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Matt Cropper, who is our consultant. He will take us through meeting number two. Thank you, Dr. Wheaton Phillip. Thank you all for coming back. Uh, really appreciate you guys and your commitment to this process and, and working, working as a group to help, uh, help Baltimore County Public Schools and particularly Johnny Cake Elementary. Uh, a little overview of the, of the agenda tonight. Uh, we really, it's all about the options tonight. We want to orient you on the maps, uh, some of the statistics and data that you'll be looking at starting today and moving forward. Um, you're going to be doing that through small group exercises to review options, and then you're going to uh, report out to the group as a whole. Um, I do see there's a little bit of an imbalance in the table assignments, so when we do meet in small groups, we'll probably have a couple of you guys move over so that we can balance out the small groups, but we can do that when we get there. An overview of the objectives. Um, this is a community-based process, a comprehensive boundary study, and you as a committee are tasked uh, to, to uh, meet the, the key objectives, the following objectives. They are to provide capacity relief to Johnny Cake Elementary School, to create viable and successful boundaries to effectively utilize capacity, and to support diversity among schools that reflects the community and the school system. There are rules to follow. These are also referred to as considerations, and these are basically the what as you're evaluating um, whether a, a line should move one way or the other, you should always ask yourself, do, am I getting closer to adhering to these considerations? Or does this move or this option deviate me further from the overall considerations? And maybe, you know, so as, as you work through this, um, I encourage you to always test any, any decision that you're, that you're considering to the considerations. There is a laminated uh, page on each table that shows those considerations so that you can always use those as a quick guide uh, as you start working in your groups. But these considerations are to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system, looking at the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, minimizing the number of times any individual students are reassigned, efficient use of capacity in affected schools, long-term enrollment and capacity trends and future capital plans, looking at not only the current but also looking at other data to support uh, what's projected down the road, location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns, phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools, and additional considerations that are uh, aligned with best practices in the industry are to use geographic features such as railroads, creeks, major highways, and things like that. And if you draw the line, if the line is drawn along a major road, that helps uh, adhere to several of the considerations. Uh, pedestrian, walkability, safety and security of students, those types of things um, that, that help, um, that help uh, looking at these considerations help align you with a lot of the other considerations that are on the board. We had some follow-up to your, uh, the last meeting, and you had some questions. Uh, one of the questions was related to state-rated capacity, and how was that determined? Um, state-rated capacity is uh, the number of students each building can adequately hold. This is defined by the Maryland State Department of Education. It's calculated based on the number of teaching stations or classrooms that, it, that each school has and how those are used. Um, it only applies to the permanent building. It does not apply to any portables or uh, um, uh, trailers and things like that that may be at a building. It's only looking at permanent capacity. Um, and there are room size and, and use standards for what may or may not count towards the state capacity. So a uh, room has to be a certain size to be counted as a classroom uh, per the, per the uh, Maryland State Department of Education. And you can refer to your background report. Uh, some, of the, some of the supplemental appendices in the background report gives some more information on state-rated capacity. 
Another question is, what's the difference between headcount and full-time enrollment, also referred to as FTE? So FTE enrollment is an adjustment made to an elementary school's total headcount enrollment for the purpose of calculating a school's official utilization. So you have 100% um, of the students in a school, grades K through 5, are counted. So every single student is counted as one student in that enrollment. You have preschool, though. Preschool uh, operates on an AM and PM session. So they take half of the total number of preschoolers that are enrolled in a building to, um, to, uh, and add that to the total enrollment number to calculate the FTE. So for instance, you have a group of kids, say 20 tw there's 20 pre preschoolers that come to an AM session. They have their education and then they go home and then 20 more students come in for the PM session. So in, in order to make sure that we can accurately represent the number of spaces that are being used in a building, they take half of that to account for the AM and PM. So you have 40 students, but really they may only be using one classroom or two classrooms um, as opposed to what if you had 40 kids being educated because half of them come in, in the AM and then half of them are coming in the, in the, in the afternoon. And that's what FTE is. It's, it's basically reducing that pre-K pre count so that we're not overcounting or overestimating uh, students inside a, uh, a building. And there's the background section also has some information on FTE to give you uh, more clarification on that. Program moves and state rated capacity adjustments. So spe some special education programs at Johnny Cake will relocate in coordination with this cap capacity relief study. Um, the, this movement will reduce the enrollment and provide additional space and capacity um, at the school. Calculations for all options include 35 fewer students at Johnny Cake Elementary as a result of this program adjustment. And, um, and so as a result of taking that, the, having, relocating that program, it does result in an increase uh, in the capacity of the building because that, those spaces are being used for special education. So the capacity of Johnny Cake as a result of that increases it from 559 currently to 588. And that's, that's as a result of moving the 35 students out and, um, and, and having the school be able to regain those, those classes for regular education. That increases the total planning capacity for us to 588 for Johnny Cake Elementary. So this is a, an, a, a glimpse of what before and after looks like in term, and also utilization. So if you look at Edmondson Heights here, you see Edmondson Heights has a state rated capacity of 589, 86.2% utilized. So um, I know that there was a, a talk before about, eight, about uh, both schools are overcrowded. When you look at the statistics and look at the data, it does suggest that Edmondson Heights does have some capacity. Um, you could see that they have 81 seats available before they get to 100% utilization. Um, Johnny Cake, on the other hand, is at 122% utilization currently. This bottom table shows you the, 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 what Johnny Cake looks like with the, after the program move. So Johnny Cake's current capacity is 559. As I said, the new capacity goes to 588. And the utilization, before we make any changes to Johnny Cake, uh, goes to 110.7, about 111%. So you can see that just that one adjustment brings down the utilization of Johnny Cake from 123 to 111, which is giving them some relief, but um, but, but not, not uh, enough to bring them below 100%. Other questions, what is the potential impact of unbuilt approved residential development on elementary enrollment? Um, and we've, we, the BCPS keeps a good track on this. There is no significant approved residential development within the Johnny Cake or Edmondson Heights boundaries at this time that, is, that, that, that the district anticipates is going to significantly increase or bring uh, kids into, this, into the system from, as a result of new construction. Another question, under what condition may students choose to stay in their school once a boundary goes into effect? And the school, uh, the, the school district has what they call policy and rule 5140, and you can find this if you, if you go to the district page and look at this. There's a lot of uh, language on this, um, but basically it's referring to special permission transfers. Um, and so special permission transfers will be approved during the first year of a boundary change for students currently enrolled in grades 4th and 5th, 7th through 8th, or 11th through 12th of the school affected by a change in attendance area. 
students expressed to wish to remain in their school through the terminal grade may do so. Um, so that means for our purposes, grades fourth and fifth, when this boundary is plan is, a, is uh, implemented, which is anticipated to be fall 2020, any student who's, who's a fourth and fifth grader as of that time, going into that year, is eligible for a special permission transfer. They can remain at their school if they choose to do so. If a student who meets the criteria above has a sibling currently enrolled in the affected school, the sibling will be given the option of remaining in the affected school through his or her terminal grade as well. So that does provide some additional flexibility for families who are impacted, especially children who are nearing the end of their elementary tenure and, uh, and uh, who, who may be impacted. Another question that you had posed, is there a utilization target for schools? Um, so BCPS does not typically set utilization targets for boundary studies. Um, however, the committee considered the study area average as a target for schools. For this uh, study, the average utilization is 98.5, and I believe that may be a typo. No. Sorry about that. That's right. 98.5 is the average utilization. So um, additional factors to consider on the projected enrollment and plan developments, which plan developments are, aren't pertinent here. So what this is is try to create as much balance, and in, in, in if I'm giving you advice as a consultant who does this all over the country, try to provide as much relief as you can to a school that's overcrowded. But it's best practice, what you don't want to do is you don't want to, and I mentioned this last committee meeting, you don't want to solve a problem at one school and create a problem at another school. So provide as much relief as you can to give them an adequate amount, a, a, a measurable amount of relief without overcrowding the other building that students are being added to. So it's really up to you guys to determine what you think is adequate for that. Um, usually we'll use the target, uh, the, the average as a, as a target, but it really can vary based on other considerations and things like that. We, uh, as a result of the small planning block review, the, the committee reviewed plot maps and uh, looked at the planning blocks. You guys met in groups and studied the maps. Um, there weren't many markups on the maps or there were no uh, specific changes requested to the planning blocks. Like you didn't say move a planning block one street over or cut this planning block in half, or com combine these two planning blocks. You didn't give us that kind of input. That's okay. We still have more work to be done. This is only second meeting. And if you have, if you continue to look at planning blocks as you do, let us know if you think a planning block violates some of the considerations. We can always make changes to the planning blocks if uh, further if needed. This is a table that shows you the, the current and the, uh, the option capacity. And again, this is really the, just the, the only change is the uh, Johnny Cake Elementary increased capacity as a result of the program adjustment. Edmondson Heights stays the same. Yes, ma'am. Yes, let's get a microphone for you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I see the, um, the result that moving the programs would have on Johnny Cake, but what about um, the possibility, maybe even the likelihood, that those programs would move to Edmondson Heights? So I don't see in the chart reflected how that would change what's available in terms of seats at Edmondson Heights. Okay. Um, so... It's my understanding that the program is not being uh, moved to Edmondson Heights, but um, if um, Dr. Wheatley Phillips, could you provide, provide some additional feedback regarding that? Thank you so much, and that is a thoughtful question. As part of this process, the goal is really to relieve overcrowding at Johnny Cake. And so naturally, the assumption wouldn't be that the programs would be moved um, over to Ed Heights. Um, that is a decision that is going to be made by the Office of Special Education in conjunction with other offices. But we can say that the move would not result in students moving from Johnny Cake to Ed Heights. But it is a tiered process. It's a process that takes um, a lot of time and consideration and working with other offices. But at this time, the decision would not be, or the result would not be, that the program would be moved to Ed Heights. So you'll start seeing tables that look similar to this, and this is hard to see. I don't expect you to look at it on the screen. Um, everybody should have picked up a packet of information uh, to supplement the binders that you got the last meeting. Um, if you weren't here at the first meeting, I think that we have a binder for you, but um, um, I'm sure we do. But uh, 
This meeting, this packet of information is pertinent to tonight. It has the PowerPoint in it, and also it has the statistics and maps and letter size in the back. That, uh, so all the stuff that's on the screen is, can be found either in the PowerPoint or on the, um, the handout in the back of the, the page here. So uh, what this does, this show just breaks down the enrollment and the great configurations and things like that to give you further information about the schools. There's the pre-program adjustments. It shows you the uh, great configurations, the capacity. It shows you the total headcount and what the FTE is. It shows the same thing in terms of utilization as enrollment, just in terms of utilization, how many seats are av available or how many seats over capacity you are. Some other statistics about how uh, that helps support how the uh, and estimations are, are calculated. I would guide you to more of the bottom table because this is a more focused on what we're looking at and based on a post program. So again, the uh, headcount, FTE enrollment here. You could see the program adjustment that's accounted for here and then the uh, adjusted uh, FTE. And then the final one here shows you the utilization percentage of the school and then uh, after the, F, the adjustments and then how many seats are available and how many uh, seats they need to get below 100 percent. Yes, ma'am. I'm trying my best to follow you here, but with okay. the numbers, because I I might have misheard you. But did you, when you remove the or if thirty some children are removed from Johnny Cake, then what did you say we would still be at a hundred percent capacity? Did I hear that right? You're still at a one hundred and eleven percent after the program move, um, which you could see right here for Johnny Cake. Currently one hundred twenty three. This is pre move. And post moves 111 percent. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure I heard that correct. So even if you move the kids, we're still going to be in the same situation. Um, you will be overcrowded still, over 100 100 percent. It'll be the same scenario. It will. Be, it won't be as 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 many students over capacity. But we'll still be overcrowded. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's correct. And then, if that's a number of 30 some children to be moved with a program and there are more children in the program. I don't even know what program you're talking about, but what if there's 55 kids in the program? Then you would move the, all of them? Um, I, th I believe that, um, I'm not sure, the, and I think that, that that lends back to what Dr. Wheatley Phillips was saying about the program moves. I think that if, as they're considering this, I would, I would think that they would be moving the entire program and uh, 35 is the estimate right now if that number changes um, I imagine that they would be moving that the number of students that participate in that program so that they can avoid having that program offered at two buildings I think they'd like to have that program relocated to a space where those students can all continue at uh, together at another building okay and I just really bring the question up because well for two reasons so I can make sure with that I understood that we're still going to be at hundred percent capacity Okay, and then we already tried or attempted last year, we already had part of our program move, and then in the summer, we got the program back. Okay. So I was just curious why the same Strategy. idea is, you know, on the table. I was just, you know, just curious. But I really just wanted for clarification mm -hmm. so I make sure I understand. Yes, I, I can't comment on the, the history of uh, program adjustment, but I think that, uh, that I, I can follow up with you on that. But you are correct. The program adjustment is, is seen as one step to give some relief. But as you, as you noted, it doesn't give them enough to relief to bring them below 100%. They're still 111%. Yes, ma'am. And that's why I think what you'll see when I look at the options, it's a comp the, what we're doing or suggesting in these drafts is a combination of a program move and a boundary adjustment to give Johnny Cake a, c a combined amount of relief through both strategies. So, um, talking to the talking about the options, I want to uh, remind everybody, or uh, or just tell you that you may have a gut reaction to these maps. That uh, you may like them, you may not like them. But just remember that everything that's being presented to you is draft. 
Everything is draft all the way through the whole course of this study until nothing's finalized until the board approves a plan. Um, and so anything is subject to change. These draft options can be modified by you. You have the power to create new or, um, or uh, scrap options or um, make modifications to these options. Before I go any further, I think someone from BCPS want to make a comment? Regarding, um, regarding the special education moves, um, there was um, an increase in enrollment where this, there was an additional classroom added after we moved students. But for the purpose of this study, I think the thing to focus on is that the program will move, all associated children with the program will move, and special ed is estimated that that's about 35 students. Okay, so there won't be anything remaining at the school. That, does that help? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Absolutely. Yep, and I think that, that that confirms what I had what I had um, assumed. Did you have a question, sir? I did. Let's get a microphone for you if we could. Um, my question is is about the, the special ed program and um, and then apples to apples in terms of students. Um, if you increase uh, of this special ed program may need uh, self containment that may need additional resources, but it's not the same as moving, um, you know, 35 non special ed students. You know, you could have a, a classroom. Thank you. <laughs> I was going in and out there. <laughs> um, but saying that if I'm moving. 35 special ed students with special needs that vary, that may require additional resources, that may also require smaller class sizes, that may require self-contained classes. They may take up, that 35 students may take up more than one classroom, whereas moving just 35 students could be like, oh, well, you know what, that's just an extra class. So that's one of the concerns I had in terms of just listening to a program moving that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, well, it's just 35 students from this school to 35 students at this school. It's just one classroom to one classroom. Because it could be these 35 students have been spread over several classrooms, and now they need to be placed at, the, at, at Edmonton Heights that they need several classrooms at Edmonton Heights. Is that question, is that question clear? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, your question is very clear, and I think what we're sharing is that, first of all, the program moves would not result in students being moved to Ed Heights. And second of all, the students that for whom we're talking about that are receiving special education services are students that are part of a very specific program. And so it's students that certainly would receive services in a self-contained classroom. There are a myriad of students that might be receiving services in a general ed setting, which is part of an inclusion. We're talking about students that are spending the majority of the day away from the general ed setting in a specific program, and they have their own set of staffing and supports around them. That program in its entirety would would be moved to another school, and the Office of Special Ed is reviewing the data and following our processes to determine what school, what setting would be best for those students. Does that help? Just a final point of clarification on that is that the utilization that is being presented reflects the adjustment at Johnny Cake for the utilization of that space that was being used as special ed space and would now be used as general education classroom space. Thank you. It's good, good stuff to clarify here. Um, so we're going to get you guys into some options here, reviewing options. Um, one of the things I'd guide you to the screenshot when you look at it, you'll notice that there's a blue outline. And that blue outline on the maps actually reflects the current um, elementary zone lines for the school. And then so when you look at the options, you'll see a background color. And so in this case, this is an area that uh, was being added to um, to Edmondson Heights from Johnny Cake and uh, as, as a particular example. So, so when you see any area that deviates from, the, from the, the blue line, and the background color represents the option. And as you're looking through these and studying these, I'll be, we'll be walking around the maps. We'd be happy to help interpret the maps with you and kind of a a analyze the differences between the options, as well as uh, uh, James Cooper from my office is over here as well. And we'd be happy to help assist in interpreting the maps in any way. 
You have uh, in your packets eight and a half by 11 maps. There's also plot maps at your table. You have reference maps as well. Behind me are some additional maps. You have subdivisions, uh, zoning, so you can see the zoning of the area. And then you have the options over up here. Uh, the last committee like to look, like to look at them uh, posted on the wall so you can kind of look at them side by side. And if you want to do that, you want to come up here and study them, you're, you're welcome to. There's also another set back in the back if you wanted to look at them back there. I know those are typically for the observers, but I don't think we have many observers. So feel free to spread out if you'd like. Um, we also have uh, maps, uh, interactive maps on the computers in front of you. If you want to look at this in the future, you can go to uh, croppermap.com slash BCPS Johnny Cake. Um, I use it on my phone. You pull that up, you can pinch, pinch zoom on your phone. There's even a button that shows you where you're located on the map. It'll zoom in on your uh, beacon, on your I icon, on your location. And it really helps you if you're driving in the district and looking at if you're in the area that's impacted and you do that, you could, it'll show you exactly where you're located, kind of help you orient you with the map. And we've done it several times already. Um, all these materials, all this information that you have is also shared online um, at bcps.org construction slash Johnny Cake. And if you go to the main page at bcps.org and you go scroll down on the left, you'll see a Johnny Cake Elementary Capacity Release Study page. All, that, all this information is there. If you, uh, if you lose your materials or you need to go back and look at some stuff and you don't have your materials with you, use that as a resource. I'll always tell committees that there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of uh, information. You have maps, tables, statistics. It sometimes is hard to take all this in. So what I recommend committees to do is break it down into a couple components. I mean, I, the way I think about when I look at it, I look at the map and I study how the maps differ and get an understanding of that. Then I'll look at the tables and see how do the tables, how the numbers differ in the tables. And then once you do that, then go back and sort of relate them together. What's, what, uh, what map change is resulting in a number change and things like that. Always uh, evaluate these as it relates to the boundary objectives and considerations. So that's important to do. Uh, and also think about ways to make them better. Uh, what we'd like, if, if, you, if you find uh, issues, things that you don't like with any of the maps, uh, we, we really want you to mark them up because we don't want to replicate a concern or something that, that you as a committee thinks is a non-starter for these maps. Um, and, if, and with that said, if you, if you scratch out a, an area on a planning block map, you can add circle another area that you think it may be better to add to a school to try to create that balance. Or you may just decide to have less relief if that's the way you feel uh, we, sh we should examine it. So just look at things as it relates to the objectives and considerations. I'm going to break down the tables for you and uh, bear with me. These are all in, in your packet. And once we get through this meeting with this orientation, all these materials will be the same moving ahead. So we won't have to do this every time. But this basically gives you a breakdown for each option. So you have the starting point, your enrollment, uh, post pro program moves, and then you can see what the anticipated enrollment is for option one, two, and three per, the, per each school. Um, and so this is what you would, if, if somebody said, what, well, how many students are they estimating in option two for Johnny Cake? You would go to this and you can give them uh, option two, 595 students estimated for Johnny Cake. And that's how, you know, this kind of answers how many students are estimated to be in the building. Utilization slide or table, this is what I prefer because it kind of uh, brings things into equalization. It's not so not such an issue here because the building capacities are the same as a result of, uh, of our work. But um, this basically shows you the percent full of each building. So currently Johnny Cake's 111 with the, with the program move. Edmondson Heights is 86. And you can see in each option, we bring, we bring Edmondson Heights utilization goes up and Johnny Cake utilization goes down. This is tough though, I will tell you, it's, it's hard because you could see where we're teetering on 98%, you don't have a lot of room. So um, in option one, Ed, Ed Heights goes to 100%, um, Johnny Cake goes down to 97. And then in other options, Ed, Ed Heights is not over 100%, but Johnny Cake is. And so you know, that's, that's really up to you to evaluate and look at that and consider those, uh, those factors. Percent minority, the impact of the current percent minority and the, and the, uh, the option percent minority. Um, so 
In our experience, this is a, about a 1% swing on option one and two in the percent minority. 1% uh, is not a, a significant uh, impact, in my opinion, but, um, but uh, you, you can see the percent minority is not significantly impacted or a, a giant swing in percent minority as a result of uh, any of the option changes. This table uh, breaks down the number of students that are impacted. So you can see in option one, 79 students are moved. Uh, option two, 56, and option three, 59. And, and uh, these tables right here break down, um, the green shows you how many students would stay, and the tan shows you how many students move. For this particular, these options so far, we're only moving students one way. We're only moving students in the Ed Heights from Johnny Cake, Johnny Cake to Ed Heights, 79 students. If we start making adjustments and moving students both ways, you'll see two tan lines, and you'll see an Ed Heights Johnny Cake, if that's something that you guys decide to, to, to examine as an option. But this gives you a breakdown on how many kids are moved, the total impact of students as a result of the options. Uh, feeder pattern adjustments are, uh, are reflected here, and you could see that you have there currently exists a small split between Johnny, for Johnny Cake between Southwest Academy and Woodlawn, and, but that split doesn't exist in the area of our study. And so and as a result of each option, there is no impact on the feeder pattern splits. They remain the same, and there is no negative impact or positive impact on feeder patterns as a result of, uh, of our work or the, the draft options that we have so far. So I'm going to break down what my thoughts are advantages and limitations of each option. These are just my brainstorming after studying the maps and the tables. You can always refer back to these in the PowerPoint if you, if you wish um, and take, it, take, take this with uh, however you'd like. But uh, so looking at option one, option one uh, draws the line down. This is all walkable area that's been identified as walkable to either Johnny Cake or Edmondson Heights. Uh, first off. This option actually draws the line uh, Ingleside, runs right here, and then everything south of Ingleside in this particular option, currently it's Johnny Cake, it's in this option it goes to Ed Heights. Um, and so one of the, uh, so one of the um, comments that I made is that driving through this area, Ingles, Ingleside's a pretty busy road. Uh, students right now that go to Johnny Cake have to cross over Ingleside to get to Johnny Cake in this particular scenario, students wouldn't have to cross over Ingleside. They could walk up Ingleside to, or through a neighborhood to get to Ed Heights, which I see that as, a, as an advantage to this option, and that prevents walking across uh, at least one busy road in this particular area. Um, another advantage is that any, all students can still walk to school, so we're not taking walkers and putting them on a bus in this scenario. Um, it's the only option that brings Johnny Cake below 100%. Um, and uh, as a result, and that's an, that's an advantage. Um, it provides the best balance of utilization among draft options without bringing Edmondson Heights over 100. I think Ed Heights goes right to 100, doesn't it, in this scenario. So it takes them right at 100. Um, and uh, some of the limitations and, and with this is that this option moves the, the greatest number of students. So the most students are moved as a result of this particular option. Option two is a little bit different. It doesn't go south of Ingleside, but it pulls an area in between Ingleside, and I believe this is Kent Road. And, um, and that, that, that area is moved from Johnny Cake to um, Ed Heights. Yes, that's Kent, Kent Road. Uh, this, this option moves the fewest number of students among all three draft options. Um, any student uh, who is affected can still walk to school, so that's an advantage. Um, the limitation that I identified with this is Johnny Cake is still over 100%. And, um, you know, as you guys work in your, in your small groups, I, I encourage you to uh, break these apart and tell us what you like and the advantages and limitations of these options, what you like about any of them, and add to what I have or affirm or negate what I have stated in my, um, in my comments. Option three is it looks a little different. It doesn't draw the line down uh, on either side of Ingleside or Kent, but it just takes the line more 
in, in this direction, uh, closer, a couple of blocks closer to Johnny Cake. Um, option three, that takes it to Carroll Road. So this is Carroll Road. Um, and uh, some of the advantages of this is that Edmonton Heights uh, zone, it's, it moves two blocks further south. I don't know if, if that, I have a question. Is, is, that, is that an advantage? I, I've driven through this area, and I know when you go down Carroll Road, some of these streets that run this way, there's, there's ho residential houses on each side of the, of, of the streets. So it's, it's a residential community. There aren't sidewalks uh, along those roads. But, um, but, you know, there are homes on either side. It's not as prominent of a road as something like Ingleside or, or Kent Road. Uh, this this uh, option moves the second fewest uh, number of students among all draft options. And then, again, these students can walk to Ed Heights. They currently walk to Johnny Cake. They, they're within the walkable zone to Ed Heights. A limitation option three is Johnny Cake is still over 100% in this particular draft. Any questions before I, before I continue? Or you guys okay? Okay. Uh, just a couple of reminders um, with regarding effective collaboration. We're working as a team here. We, uh, we want to keep the team dynamic and keep it civil and, uh, and peaceful. Uh, be inclusive by allowing each group member adequate time and space to voice ideas, ideas let hear each other out. Um, you guys are a good group to work with. Sometimes we have to remind groups of this because redistricting or uh, boundary studies can be controversial and, uh, and, and does um, get, get contentious. So these are just reminding you of some of the norms. Um, spend adequate time considering how each proposed change will impact diverse stakeholders. Uh, be mindful of the boundary study considerations on slide 10 and 11 and use these as, each as a guide as you collaborate on, a, on this process. If a conflict arises, just make sure that you keep it, keep it as uh, any opinion that you have. If it's, if it's an opinion that differs from other people, just make sure that you keep that opinion st and state it as your opinion as not as opposed to, uh, well, you know, making you statements and, you know, you guys are saying this and, I, and we're saying this. Just keep it like singular like that. I think that that's, that's something that they, uh, the experts encourage us to do. And just expect that it may be non-closure. This, this, the result of this plan may not be perfect, and there still may be pros and cons with any, with any particular uh, uh, draft recommendation. We're going to give you guys about 30 minutes to review these options. There's three. Each of you has a plot map, an interactive map. There's markers. We encourage you to write anything on the, on the maps as long as put post-it notes. There's also a sheet of paper for the parking lot questions. If you've got questions, you can... Uh, write them in there, and we'll follow up with you on those. And then once you guys are done working in your small groups, we'll, uh, we'll meet as a whole group and talk um, and share, share out with the whole group. Let's see. We, uh, two, four, five. Uh, so maybe if we had two people uh, move to the red table, uh, that way we can balance the groups off a little bit. And then when you guys, when you guys are done, just remember that we're, we're going to hand the mic to you. One of you. One of you would be the speaker. You can pass the mic if you'd like to, you know, certainly can share speaking duties and one person can record. You guys can handle that. Just make sure that you document stuff so that we can take it back and study your, your input. You guys have any questions? Okay, we'll give you some time to uh, dive into the maps.
Okay, guys, I think uh, we're going to get back. We're going to get back together as a group. I know that there's questions and conversations going on, which is all really good. If there's anything that we haven't answered in some of our discussions, please put them on paper. And uh, even any questions that we have answered around the tables, uh, please uh, share those with us so that we can uh, write them down and the whole committee and the, and the public can also benefit from, from your uh, thoughtful questions that you guys have. So why don't we start, um, if we want to start with this group and maybe you guys can tell us some of your conversations and thoughts. If you have a, I saw you had some markups, if, if you could hold up the map and, uh, and uh, we can look at it. And, Anything you have to, to share, we're, we're all ears now. And let's get a microphone. OK. OK. We, um, we actually didn't like any of the options that were before us, so we kind of took it upon ourselves to make a new one. Um, some of the things that we were considering was uh, the walkers and the, um, the, the, the having at least amount of students crossing Ingleside, um, but then also trying to keep that balance as close to that 98% uh, for each of the schools. So we saw in the options, there was option one, which moved 79 students from um, uh, Johnny Cake to Edmondson Heights, pushing Edmondson Heights right to that 100% and uh, Johnny Cake to that 97%. Uh, the other two options moved about 50 students and had uh, Johnny Cake still above 100% and um, Edmondson Heights not quite there. So we thought that maybe we could even go a little bit more towards the median of that number to have not 79, but to have um, approximately 69 students move. Um, and the way we did that was we did a kind of a combination of options one and two. Um, by taking a portion of option one, which are these, this large group of walkers on uh, this side of Johnny Cake, and then going with a, a, a small group from option two um, that share a neighbor, seem to share a neighborhood line here um, and having those students then. So it would be these students would still be going to um, Johnny Cake. These 18 students would still be going to Johnny Cake, whereas with these uh, 14 students approximately would then be coming to uh, Edmondson Heights. And so we thought that that would be another option. Is there, can you guys see that? It's a very, so. very good, good, thoughtful uh, option, in my opinion, sir. I could see lots of advantages of that, and, you know, not drawing the line as close to Johnny Cake there, but still giving them relief. So um, we'll, we'll take that and draft, draft that as an additional option for the next meeting and give you some supporting data to put in the, the batch of options to consider. Um, we, we like those options, and that covers a lot of things that we talked about. Um, we um, had some different thoughts about the different maps, and I think as a group we probably liked option one the best. And um, we... We really like the idea of keeping the kids who are on this side of Ingleside on that side of Ingleside so that they don't have to cross that fairly major road. So whereas when we first looked at the numbers, I was like, ugh, option one is too much movement. I don't like that. When we looked at how it actually played out, we felt more comfortable with that than the others, actually. And then having a lot of Ed Heights representation on our team saying, you know, really, we are one community, you know? It, it's not gonna be a big adjustment for kids to go from one school to the next. These kids are already friends, and they already play together, and they're already in the same community. So um, that was definitely an argument for option one. Um, option two, if you remember, has the piece above it that juts out a little bit. That's okay. Yeah, this one. We felt like this one was awkward and, and our least favorite overall um, because A, it 
it just looks a little awkward, but more than that, um, these kids who are so geographically close to Johnny Cake are then now being moved to Edmonton Heights. And even if it's still walkable, it's, it's still a long ways for elementary school kids to walk when they have a school right there. So that was our least favorite. Um, and I don't remember if we talked too much about three. Let's pull it up. Oh, right. Um, we did talk about three. Um, we think this is our second favorite in general. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, we thought this one kind of worked, and the benefit of it is it moved less kids, um, and so that's a perk. And we weren't then putting the burden of the overcrowding as much onto Edmondson Heights, which isn't overcrowded now, so then you're not just transferring it. And the kids do have to cross Ingleside, right? So that, that's why option one was our favorite. But I also am intrigued by your idea. I think you guys came up with a good program, and we were all kind of mumbling about it when you were talking. So good job, guys. <laughs> Anybody have anything else to add? Any other comments from the group? I know there were some a lot of parking lot questions and things like that that uh, please uh, keep, keep behind, and we'll collect those and follow up with you on those. Um, I am I'm very encouraged by this night tonight's meeting and uh, you know your input and your feedback. I think it's we're you're moving in the right direction. You're thinking things in terms of the criteria, the objectives, and the considerations. So um, we will take this scenario that you've marked up and uh, and create an option four and bring that back to you and to and continue the exploration. Um, I would encourage you just to continue studying things as uh, between this meeting and the next meeting. And if you have any thoughts, you know, keep, keep note of them and bring that with you to the next meeting. You'll have some time to study the material between now and the next meeting. And uh, just keep, keep doing your good work of uh, studying, the, studying the material. Um, does anybody have any other comments from your small group uh, discussions or anything that you wanted to share as a result of the, everything that's led up to where we are now with this meeting or the meeting prior? And I know it came up earlier, but this is also on our parking lot sheet. Um, and I just wanted to be part of the record because I'm also involved in the, um, the previous meeting. Um, so we do have a lot of elementary schools in the area that are at or very close to capacity. And we also have a lot of programs that we're talking about moving out of current schools. But there's, I mean, I don't know where we're going to put them. And I know we're not going to know that tonight. I understand what everybody's saying. But it's just something that's on my mind is, if not only these two schools that we're talking about, but the other two schools in the study and Chadwick, I think the other school is called that's already way over capacity. Like everything we know around it is also at capacity. I, I just am kind of curious about what's gonna happen to those programs. And I know we have a lot of community members who are interested in, in knowing what's gonna happen to those programs. Yes, ma'am. And it's been a common question. It's a question that um, that several committee members around these tables have asked and as well as the uh, prior study and so um, I know that the, the, the district will do their best to try to get some resolution on that as quick as possible as soon as we have information or they have information we'll share it to you so to, to keep you informed and not keep you on edge with the, with uh, with those deliberations um, so but I appreciate that it certainly is a valid valid concern and valid thing to be on your mind um, any other, anybody else have any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, between now and the next meeting, I just uh, remind you uh, the different resources we have as you guys uh, go back to your schools, talk to fellow teachers and parents or neighbors and things like that. Uh, just uh, spread the word about what's going on. And we want the more participation, the better from the public and the more transparency and the more people know about what we're doing in this room the better so um, if they ask how how can I uh, participate remember remind them that there's a website uh, for this for this study and that they can go there and view all the materials they can catch up on all the meetings that have occurred so far um, if they have any questions or even you as committee members if you have questions or concerns or thoughts you can always email at Johnny cake relief study at bcps.org and all of that information is being studied and reviewed and monitored. And uh, as, as feedback comes in, when we get uh, feedback, uh, we'll, we'll sh we will share that 
with you. Um, uh, we, the public can always tell the people who aren't members of the committee, they can come here and sit at the observer table and they can watch this whole process every single meeting. Um, they can't participate in these meetings per se, but they can come, they can look at maps in the back and really study everything and then we'll always be around and at break times and at the end of the meetings to help uh, to, to, to do what we can to help uh, answer any questions. There is a public information session on February 27th and that's designed to uh, invite the public to participate. That's actually their opportunity to come here as a community, learn about the process. We'll have copies of maps spread out and you as committee members will be standing around the maps as well as myself and staff and we'll be talking through uh, and talking about questions they have and discussing them with them. We will have a survey as well that runs from February 27th to March 13th that invites them to, to give us some input via that survey related to the options that are under consideration at that time. All these meetings are online. Uh, if you want to go back and, uh, and go and look at what was discussed and what material was, was brought up, um, I commonly go back and look at this to see, uh, uh, get feedback on, remind myself on what somebody said and this and that. So it's really good for the, the record and the history. And then a, a Port of, Board of Education public hearing on May 15th. So once this is recommended to the board, they will host a, a public hearing where they invite the public to come and you can give uh, feedback specific to this study as, a, as members of the public or members of the committee. You'll have three minutes to give your input and the board is all sitting there listening and taking in your comments um, at that time. So lots of different ways for the public to participate and to, uh, to be informed on this process. So we have a little bit of a break with this group. Um, uh, our next meeting is February 20th, 2019. Um, one of the things I'll remind you or uh, point to you is that the meeting is, is scheduled to be from 6 to 8 p.m. So it's not, uh, we start, you were starting at a later time. We're doing two processes at the same time, so we staggered the times for the first two meetings. But moving ahead, we're, move, we're working with a full two-hour block to give you guys as much time as you need to look at uh, options. And at that meeting, we'll continue to explore options and start narrowing things down in preparation for the public meeting. Um, it's going to be here at Woodlawn. And, um, and uh, if, we won't, if we don't need all two hours, we'll let you guys go early. We're not going to keep you here any longer than you have to. But, um, but so that meeting is in, on February 20th, so you have a little bit of break between now and then. Anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts before we adjourn? Okay, well, thank you guys very much for all your help, and keep up the good work, and uh, we'll see you on February 20th.